Welcome to yet another episode of Game of Thrones Abridged on Alt Swift X. Today we have a relatively short chapter after the monstrosity that was the previous Catelyn chapter. This is a Ned chapter, uh, a Ned 9 a chapter. This is the ninth Eddard chapter, and it begins with a brothel scene. So we have a whole bunch of uh, buxom wenches about, uh, fraternizing with some of the Stark men, with Heward and Jory Castle. Uh, and Littlefinger is here, and he's chatting with a tall, elegant woman with a feathered gown and skin as black as ink. And this woman is Alayaya, or Leia, Le Leia, Ayala. She has a nickname. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but she's Alalea, and she runs this brothel, I believe, and she happens to be the woman who Cersei Lannister th thinks at one point is Tyrion's lover. It's actually Shay, but Cersei thinks it's Alalea, and since Cersei uh, is a fucking sociopath with no regard for human suffering, uh, she has Alalea beaten in an attempt to hurt Tyrion, and then Tywin comes along and whips Alalea and has her scourged in the street, and all, all manner of terrible fucking things happen to Alalea, uh as a result of dickhead lords playing their petty games. So I think the best possible advice to anyone who isn't a High Lord of Westeros is not to get involved with the High Lords of Westeros. Uh, so, so we've got this brothel scene, this colourful brothel scene. Uh, Jory Castle has a wry smile. Uh, Heward is losing his his clothing. They're playing a game where you like strip poker, except this is Westeros, so it's probably strip cr crevasse or some shit, uh, some some kind of strip game that they're playing. And then Ned comes out, and he says, "All right, we're done here," and they head out of the room. Now, Ned has not come here to 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 tumble in the hay with a buxom wench. Ned has come here on the bidding of Littlefinger, because Littlefinger said that he had a brothel to show Ned that contained a bastard son of Robert Baratheon, bastard child of Robert Baratheon, that's why they're here. And Ned has done his business, so he heads out of the brothel. Uh, Littlefinger is with Ned, and he takes his time saying his farewells. He makes a joke and has a chat with Alalea and kisses her hand and does all this stuff. He takes his time. It's, it's almost as though Littlefinger is doing everything he can to slow Ned down from leaving King's Landing, as though he's trying to get him to stay here in order to better ferment chaos between the, the, the Lannisters and the Starks. It, it's almost like he's up to something. Uh, and and Littlefinger sort of does all these witty little ramble witticisms. He talks about, uh, oh, you know, I heard that the hand of the king uh, uh, acts with the with the king's talks with the king's voice and and rules with the king's sword. Does that also mean that the hand of the king fucks with the king's? And then he gets interrupted, which means we never get to find out what word Littlefinger was going to use. I mean, presumably he wouldn't say penis. I mean, that's a bit too anatomical. Would he have said manhood? That's a pretty popular one in Game of Thrones. But there are all sorts of possibilities. I mean, he he said with the king's ex, king's ding-a-ling. There are some rhyming possibilities there. Uh, uh, kings, uh, uh, well, no, we're not going to get <laughs> into that. So then, anyway, so ba so Ned's like, no, fuck, no, I don't want to hear about dicks. Uh, I came here for help in my investigation. Just, I'm, I'm grateful for that, but that doesn't mean I want to hear your fucking prattling nonsense, okay? I don't want to hear it. And then Littlefinger goes, ooh, look who's a prickly little direwolf today. Oh, aren't you, aren't you serious? Oh, Littlefinger and Ned are like are like oil and water in terms of personality. Ned just wants to get shit done, and Littlefinger just wants to sort of dance about verbally and sort of make himself think he's clever. That's sort of Littlefinger's jam. And so they are totally opposed to each other in those respects. 
And anyway, so they're heading out of the brothel, and Jory brings around the horses with young Will. Young Will is pulling up his pants because he's had a dance with a uh, barefoot whore. I, I like them barefoot, actually. The barefoot whores are actually... They cost more, I heard, at this particular brothel. It's the barefoot... I mean, Quentin Tarantino would would go with the barefoot... Anyway... Um, so they're like, all right, so we're going to head back to the castle because we're done here. Uh, and then Littlefinger continues sort of rambling about how brothels are very sound investments. They're better investments than ships because unlike ships, uh, whores seldom sink, which would be a good name for a, um, punk band or album, I think. Um, and, and Peter is just sort of rambling and Ned lets him prattle on because he has no interest in Littlefinger's witticisms. And then it starts raining and the rain is warm as blood and relentless as old guilts. That's not foreshadowing anything, is it? But it also connects in Ned's nady little head to the noggin to Lyanna. As soon as Ned starts thinking about blood and guilts, he starts thinking about Lyanna. And he talks about how back when Lyanna was originally promised to marry Robert Baratheon, uh, he was chatting to this about this with Lyanna, and Lyanna was saying, I heard Robert fathered a child on some girl in the Vale. And Ned was like, oh, yeah, he did do that, but, but he'll stay faithful to you when, when you marry him, Lyanna. And Lyanna says, love is sweet, but it cannot change a man's nature. And that's an interesting line, if only because... That's pretty much, I think, the only line that we hear Leanna say. I mean, apart from Promise Me, Ned, I don't think we have any actual lines of dialogue uh, from Leanna apart from, from those two. Um, and it seems kind of an innocuous enough line. I don't know if we can pick much particular meaning out of out of love is sweet, but it cannot change a man's nature. I mean, you know, I guess that can apply to a bunch of the characters in the series. Um in certain ways, but I don't think it's a big deal. But anyway, so Ned's thinking about Lyanna, uh, and, oh, that child in the veil, by the way, is Maya Stone, who we met in the previous chapter, Robert's bastard Maya. Uh, and, and, and then Ned remembers his business in the brothel. So the point of Ned coming to the brothel was to meet one of Robert Baratheon's bastards, because John Aaron was investigating the bastards. Ned still hasn't made the leap of understanding the significance of the bastards, which is their dark hair, and this particular bastard is called Barra. Uh, and is the child of a woman with light red hair and a powdering of freckles across the bridge of her nose. Uh, and George Martin even takes the time to describe that her breasts are freckled too. Uh, uh, that's, yes. Uh, and, and, and so Ned observes, Ned observes the baby's fine dark hair. And, and, and Barra's mother says, she, she looks just like Robert, doesn't she? With, with the, with the dark hair, even though my hair is red. So again, you can almost hear Ned's head cogs turning with Ned starting to think, hmm, it really does seem as though all of Robert's children have dark hair, but he still hasn't made the connection with the fact that Joffrey and Marcella and Tommen have blonde hair. Anyway, so he continues to think about Lyanna again, and he thinks about, and he thinks about how, he thinks about the promises that he'd made Lyanna as she lay dying, and the price he'd paid to keep them. And then in the next... And then a couple paragraphs later, Ned sees Jon Snow's face in front of him. It, R plus L equals J just seems so clear in, retro, in, in retrospect of these paragraphs. All this talk about children and promises and blood and, and guilt and secrets, it, 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 it kind of makes the alternative R plus L equals J theory seem kind of ridiculous sometimes when things seem laid out in a way that fits so closely to r plus l equals j i think but anyway so uh and then yeah so so this this poor mother of barra who's been living at this brothel because she's like she i mean, I mean she assures eddard that oh i haven't slept with anyone else since robert i'm i've remained faithful and you know i don't want any jewels or nothing but you know if robert could you know, look after me or do something, that'd be real great. <laughs> and she's fucked, basically. Like, 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 she's trying to protect herself and her child, uh, but she's not likely to get a whole lot of personal support from the king. The, I, I don't think the king has a lot of concern for Barra and Barra's mother's well-being. 
Uh, but this is the situation that she's in. And Ned promises, oh, yeah, we'll look after you. But he says that feeling, feeling, feeling the heart cut out of him. So Ned feels very sorry for Barra and Barra's mother. Uh, Barra and Barra's mother, of course, are later murdered by Cersei Lannister. Uh, because you basically you basically can't be an innocent person in King's Landing without having Cersei Lannister come and murder the fuck out of you at some point. It's just like a fact of life. When you look at those graphs of top ten causes of mortality within a population, you know, the top one's cancer, the second one is heart disease, and the third one is Cersei Lannister comes and murders your fucking guts out. That accounts for 25% of all mortalities in King's Landing, according to the latest statistics. Uh, And so Ned keeps on going, and he thinks about some of Robert's other bastards. He thinks about the boy at Storm's End. Edric Storm is that boy who um, who Stannis Baratheon tries to sacrifice to Relora at one point. Because if Cersei doesn't get you, fucking Stannis Baratheon will. It's just dangerous living in Westeros. Um... And and so oh, and, and the story behind the birth of the conception of Edric Storm is that uh, is that at Stannis's wedding to Selyse Florent, Robert Baratheon met this met this woman uh, met this Florent woman and took her up to Stannis's bedchamber to Stannis's wedding bed and broke in the wedding bed with this Florent girl before Stannis could get up there while Stannis was still dancing. Uh, I'd. I'd I don't know, but I hope that Stannis Baratheon and his new wife came upstairs to their wedding bed to find Robert and the Florent girl in there already. That would have been amusing. What if they just settled it all with a foursome? Do you think... How how differently would the politics of Westeros have turned out if if Robert and Stannis and the two Florents just bonded over a good old-fashioned foursome? I mean, all of the enmity and, and, and angst between Robert and Stannis could have dissolved. Stannis would have would have told Robert about his suspicions about Joffrey not being the king. Stannis wouldn't have had to run off and become king in his own right. I mean, by the powers of Stannis and Robert united, I mean, maybe Renly could have gotten on board as well. Maybe the whole war over the five kings could have been averted. So next time... You're facing conflict in your life. Just think if the solution could be solved by a simple foursome. Never rule out that rule out that option. Uh, anyway, so Littlefinger talks some more about uh, all of uh, Robert's bastards. He mentions a pair of twins that Robert fa- that Robert apparently fathered at Casterly Rock, and Littlefinger says that Cersei had the babes killed and sold the mother to a passing slaver because of again C- Cersei is like the boogeyman in Cer- in in King's Landing or, or Westeros apparently if you i mean lock, hide your wives lock up your children because Cersei's coming and she'll probably murder you uh interesting though is the fact that you know we don't have any independent confirmation that this ever actually happened with Cersei killing the twins and selling the mother that we're hearing this remember from Littlefinger and you got to remember and and you know like like Ned Stark definitely you know he interprets this as a rumor like you know he says that ugly tales like this are told of every great lord but he can believe it of Cersei Lannister readily enough Ned believes Littlefinger's tale about Cersei killing the twins but should we We've got to remember Littlefinger's motivations here, right? Littlefinger is trying to foment conflict between the Starks and the Lannisters. Maybe Littlefinger chose to chose to tell this lie. Maybe he made up this story about these twins being killed by Cersei as a way of creating the conflict, just like Littlefinger chose to lie about the knife, saying that it was owned by Tyrion Lannister. Littlefinger, they say that Littlefinger lies as, as easily as other men breathe, you know? And I think we should fucking apply this and realize that maybe this particular anecdote about Cersei is untrue. Maybe it is. Maybe it is true. We we don't know. But just look at Littlefinger's words critically, I I think, is a good idea. Uh, And and Ned thinks about, about Robert. He thinks about how Robert has become very practiced at shutting his eyes to things he does not wish to see, which is, I think, a sad truth about Robert Baratheon, and indeed about many men in power. Uh, And... But but Ned continues to scratch his noggin and thinks, but why would John Arryn take a, su- such an interest in the king's bastard children? The answer being because of the Lannister incest, but Ned still hasn't worked that out. 
uh, and, uh, blah, 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 um, and and then Robert finds uh, then Ned finds himself thinking about Rhaegar Targaryen for the first time in years. He finds himself remembering Rhaegar Targaryen, and the thought that Eddard has about Rhaegar Targaryen is, he wonders if Rhaegar had frequented brothels. He thinks not. Now that is, I believe, the only thought that Ned has of Rhaegar Targaryen in the entire time we have him as a point of view character in Game of Thrones. And that's interesting, because, like, supposedly, the official story is that Rhaegar Targaryen is the man who abducted, kidnapped Ned's dear sister, Lyanna Stark, raped her half a dozen times, and then left her for dead in the Tower of Joy, after which Ned had to come and rescue Lyanna and watch her die. Supposedly, Rhaegar Targaryen is the person who did this, to Ned's dear sister Lyanna. If that were the case, wouldn't you think that Ned would have some harsher thoughts to lay on Rhaegar Targaryen, this supposed rapist? And yet what Ned's what Ned thinks is he thinks that Rhaegar probably didn't frequent brothels. Which I mean kind of kind of I mean not to get too into it, but would you wouldn't think that suggests a rapist, would you? someone who doesn't frequent, frequent brothels. I don't know the statistics on that. But the point is, it's it's very telling that Ned thinks this way about Rhaegar Targaryen. He doesn't seem to demonise him in the way that Robert Baratheon does. Robert Baratheon is constantly going on about how evil Rhaegar Targaryen is, and yet Ned, who actually met with Lyanna in her last days does not have these horrible thoughts. So again, obviously, this all ties in to R plus L equals J. This is explained perfectly by R plus L equals J, because, you know, Ned, Ned might not... Ned wouldn't know the full story about Rhaegar's true nature from Lyanna, but he would at least know that Rhaegar didn't abduct her, didn't rape her, and that explains why he doesn't have harsh thoughts towards him. That seems the most reasonable interpretation at this point, I think. But anyway, fucking high alert, because a bunch of dudes have just run out across the street. Uh, Ned is being confronted by soldiers. There are blokes running in front with spears and armor and swords, and there are blokes running behind, and they've been blocked off within the street. And everyone's like, shit, what's going on? And Jory, Jory Castle, good old, good old Jory Castle, his response to these men co- suddenly coming out and stopping them is Jory immediately draws his sword and yells, make way or die. Which is very sort of brave and bold and upstanding, but you've got to, you got, you got to ask, is that the best way to defuse this situation? I mean, no one's attacking anyone yet. There, there isn't an, like, it isn't apparent that anyone's about to hurt anyone yet at this point, and yet Jory, Jory, a, a member of a party of, like, a few people, against, like, 20 dudes, and his response is to escalate the situation by pulling out his sword and yelling, make way or die. That seems to me a dumb decision. But I suppose that's why Ned's in charge, isn't it? This is why Jory isn't in charge. Although he is captain of the guards, isn't he? Is he... should he be? I don't know. Probably some nepotism, because the castle... the castles... the the castles are so close to the Starks. Nep- nepotism would fuck up the whole fucking structure of Westerosi society, surely. Because, like, the whole the whole fundamental system that the society runs on is the idea that people get positions of power and status based on heredity. Hereditary. Heredity. You get a job not by demonstrating that you're the most qualified and able, you get a job by coming out of the right vagina which is ridiculous. I mean, surely the whole society would run better if you got jobs based on merit. Well, you'd think so. There are those studies that show that apparently uh, if you take like a standard like business organization and uh, instead of using the usual system of promotions, which is promote someone whenever they're doing a really good job, if you just promote people at complete random, that organization becomes more effective and efficient than if you use the usual system of promoting people who are good. And the reason why that is, apparently, I don't know if this is just another myth, please correct me, uh, is that the system of promoting people who are doing well doesn't work because 
people rise to their position th- because people keep as people get uh, promoted they eventually rise to a position where they are no longer really good and that's why they don't get promoted again whenever someone's excelling you promote them to a different job or different you know rank or whatever which means that they're no longer doing the thing that they were really good at I, I, there are better ways to explain it, I'm sure, but that always stuck in my head as interesting. And Jory Castle might be an example of why the opposite system might make sense. I don't fucking know. But the important fact is that the Lannisters are confronting the Starks because they are Lannisters. There are roaring lions on breastplates and such. There's yellow, there's crimson against the Stark grey. And Jamie Lannister calls out and says, Such a small wolf pack. Uh, and Littlefinger, who has found himself trapped in a Lannister bear trap, lion trap, caught in a trap of kind of his own devising, but Littlefinger is caught in this, oh shit, I don't want to be here, I want Ned to be in here, but not me, uh, so Littlefinger tries to defuse the situation a bit by going, uh, can you not do this while I'm here, please? Uh, and Jamie uh, sort of is aggressive and sarcastic which is a nasty combination so the reason why Jamie has come here is because he is angry that Tyrion Lannister has been captured by Catelyn Stark Jamie has a very close relationship with Tyrion and Jamie also is known for rashness uh, there was some line about Jamie that Jamie will never untie a knot when he can just slash the rope with his sword which I think captures Jamie quite well because indeed Jamie's response to uh, Tyrion being kidnapped is not to have a have a have an open open and respectful conversation with Ned Stark. It's to run at Ned Stark's men with a bunch of swords and try to kill him. That's more Jamie Lannister's style. Uh, rash, bold, aggressive, violent. That's Jamie Lannister in book one. Um, and Ned is like, well, look, I yes, I, I had Tyrion captured because we needed to, uh, you know, take him to justice for his crimes. Um, and Littlefinger groans in dismay because he's like, oh god, that was not the right thing to say. Littlefinger's trying to talk his way out of this. Uh, and then Jamie aggressive, gr- aggressively is like, yeah, fuck this. He rips out his sword and he's like, Eddard, fight me, cunt, come at me, bro. I will fucking butcher you like the king I had butchered, when, the King Ares. I'm the Kingslayer, mate. You don't fuck with the Kingslayer. Look at me. I've got a gilded sword. Uh, and then he, uh, and then, he, and then he gives Littlefinger an out. Jamie's like, "Oh, by the way, scamper off, Littlefinger. Go play with your little friends. Get out of here. Let let the big men fight." And so Littlefinger, to his enormous relief, is allowed to scamper ab- scamper away. Uh, lucky him. He didn't get caught in the trap that he caused. Uh, and Ned starts evaluating the situation. He's like, "Yep, all right. We got three blokes. Uh, I've got Jory and 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 Harwin or whoever it was against uh, twenty other blokes. You know, you know who was it? Who was it who said in the previous Aya chapter that one Northman is worth twenty of these Southern bastards? Who said that? That that hypothesis is about to be tested rigorously and scientifically by this fight that's about to happen, uh, and it doesn't go well for the Starks." And Jamie Lannister comes up to Ned, and he and he pokes Ned's chest with the gilded sword that had sipped the blood of the last of the Dragon Kings. I mean, that's a bit cool, isn't it? I mean, it's it's fantasy and it's sort of twelve year old boy stuff, but but it's a sword that sipped the blood of the last of the Dragon Kings. I mean, come on, if that doesn't make you rigid, I don't know what the fuck won't will. Uh, and so, yeah, shit's getting pretty real. Ned is, but Ned says, but hey, speech check, uh, don't kill me because uh, if you kill me, Catelyn will kill Tyrion. And Jamie's like, hmm, speech check successful. All right, I won't kill you. But since Jamie in book one is a fucking sociopath who, like Cersei, will just kill cunts for the fun of it, he says, all right, we won't kill Ned, but we are going to kill his two mates. Uh, so he leaves, and he leaves his 20 men to kill Ned's two mates. Uh, which is a bit, a bit rude, frankly. Uh, and so immediately the Stark, the three Starks, Ned and Jory and, and the other bloke are like, shit, alright, let, uh, it's real. So Jory, so Jory immediately, like, charges through the Lannister men, and he, like, breaks through the Lannister line. Uh, and they start fighting, and yeah, Heward is is the other guy. Heward starts fighting, and but he gets killed uh, by the other blokes. 
And then Jory, who who had gotten sort of away almost, he 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 turns around and, and rides back in through the Lannister men. So he could have tried to run away, but he didn't. He chose to risk his life to continue fighting for Ned and the North. Um, and then Ned's horse slips. In, in the show, uh, Ned gets a spear through his leg from one of the Lannister men, but in the, in the, in the books, Ned's horse just, just trips, uh, has a little stumble, uh, and Ned gets, gets a horse on top of his leg, which is a pretty sure way to get a boo-boo. Uh, and so, so Jory, who heroically charged back in to fight the Lannisters, um, gets killed by a whole bunch of Lannisters. Uh, again, probably a poor strategic decision from Jory, honestly. Th- this guy should probably not be making the calls, to be quite frank. I don't think he should be captain of guards. Uh, but, but you know, admire his bravery, I suppose. Uh, so Ned falls off his horse, uh, and the horse falls onto his leg, uh, and Ned can see the splintered bone poking through his calf. Uh, and I'm not a doctor, but I would diagnose that as suboptimal. Oh, also, it's interesting that when Jory is killed by the Lannisters, we, we have a description of the swords rising and falling as they close in around him, which I think is reminiscent of the death of Waymar Royce in the prologue when the others kill Waymar Royce, um, with the swords rising and, cir- and falling around him like a circle. I think that sounds... I think that's a familiar image, but it doesn't really mean anything, I suppose. Um, so Ned is having a, a pretty bad time. Uh, the Lannister men leave because, you know, they were instructed not to kill Ned. Um, but Hewitt is dead and Jory is dead, and Ned is left broken and 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 quite upset in the mud. Uh, and there are a whole bunch of people watching around because, you know, they're in a brothel. They're in the middle of the city, and a whole bunch of random random common folk are watching, but they're not doing anything, because of course, they know that if you stick your head out, uh, Cersei Lannister or someone will fucking cut it off, so the peasantry wisely don't get involved. Uh, and so, and so, when Littlefinger comes back with the CD watch, they find Ned there in the mud, lying in the street, cradling Jory Cassell's body in his arms. It's, <clears throat> it's at this moment that you've really got to give props to house Cassell, 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 Cascus, Cuscus, Cuscus, House Cuscus. Wouldn't it be great if every house in Westeros was named after food? You'd have like, um, you'd have like House Carbonara of of the of of the of the, of the, of the green fields, and you'd have House Bolognese, and that all be part. Well, like the like the different regions would be based on different cuisines. So you'd have like the Italian pasta based reach. Um, and you'd have the sort of hearty English North, and you'd have the sort of, you know, Moroccan flavorful Dawn, and, and, uh, that would be good. George would love it, because he's all about those food descriptions. He would have the chance for so many more food descriptions if every house was a food. That'd be amazing. Uh, but House Cassell is kind of, kind of... Amazing, really, in terms of how much House Cassell has given to House Stark. So not only is there Jory Cassell, who who sacrifices his own life to try and help protect the Starks, and Jory was basically just a G and a great guy from all that we know in this book. He's also always nice to Arya and stuff, and everyone seems to love Jory. But not only that, there's Roderick Cassell, who was, was the Master at Arms guy, and he trained all the Stark kids, and he's so loyal to Catelyn, and he fucking fought for the Starks down to the last when he gets killed at Winterfell all those books later. So Roderick was, gave his life and all his energies to the Starks. And there's also Martin Cassell, who went to the Tower of Joy with Ned. Martin Cassell was one of the seven... Was it seven? The seven who went... Seven? I think Seven, who went to the Tower of Joy with Ned and died there for the Starks. And there's also Beth Cassell, who's the daughter of someone, Roderick maybe? One of the Cassell kids, Beth Cassell. And you know, and you know where she is right now? She is the last surviving named Cassell. You know where she is? She's in the Dreadfort. After all the shit that went down in the Winterfell, in, in Winterfell, some prisoners were taken to the Dreadfort, and Beth Cassell is one of them in the appendix to Feast. Isn't that fucked? That there are so many, like, unsung victims and heroes in this story, and I think the Cassell family is one of them. 
Uh, but Ned, meanwhile, is having a bad time. He is injured, he's losing consciousness, uh, he's quite, quite badly wounded, and he sort of blearily comes to semi-consciousness and sees Grand Maester Picel looming over him and giving him milk of the poppy for the pain, and then Ned loses consciousness. And Grand Maester Picel is really not who you would want looking after you, to be honest, because remember what happened to John Aaron. John Aaron died of poison, poison from Lysa Aaron, and... Of course, we find out later that the 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 the, the Picel chose to make John Aaron die quicker by refusing him medical treatment from the other Maester and taking John into his own personal medical care in order to deliberately deprive him of proper medical care and let him die. Because Picel thought that Cersei wanted John Aaron dead, that Cersei had poisoned John Aaron when it was actually Lysa Aaron. So Picel, the last important patient we know about, died under Picel's hands deliberately. It it's it would not be unreasonable for Picel to think the same of Ned. I mean I mean, Ned was attacked by Lannisters, so Picel may well make the deduction that, well, maybe the Lannisters want Ned dead too, so I'll choose not to treat him and let let him die from this wound. I mean, Ned could have quite easily died, surely. I mean, with bones sticking out of his leg, he, he could have fucking bled out in the street, couldn't he? Again, no doctor, but the bones are meant to stay inside the meat bag, right? I'm pretty sure. Unless you're a, um, a, a bison. Um, are horns the same as bones? Do the, is that like... Or is it more like, um, nails and, 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 and teeth? Someone, someone tell me. This is great. Having, I can just ask questions and you guys, like, just work it out. Like, Clement, Clementstra, the, the Greek lady who killed the, I can just ask questions and you guys, it's amazing. It's like Google, but, but, but slower, but also, but also, you know, kind of better in some ways. That's what I think anyway. So thank you for listening to this episode of Game of Thrones Abridged on Alt Swift X. I will say that there are... There are movements, possibilities, transformations, things happening, possible future projects, outlets related to this kind of swift nonsense, but different. There's, there's possible new things coming. I may put a link in a place at some point. But anyway, thank you, and I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you tune in for the next one. Cheers.